And then the person um, working on that other class emails the agent the lease that has to be complete. All of a sudden, now your you know stamp code is broken because they've made a change to the class. A third level is is uh, test context, and that's when you know everything's on file and everything's kind of run, but there's been some code changes to some things such that uh, the tests don't pass. So maybe you were you know relying on a method which did some kind of computation and changed some other value, and then someone unwittingly made a change to that. Class, maybe they tried to make it more often or work, you know, run run more quickly, and in so doing, changed its semantics so that it didn't match the class that you had before. Thus, leading to a test failure when you try to run your test on your code with the same on their code. Their code now runs differently. Your code runs longer than them, and you start to get error. Okay, so you're going to run into probably all of these different together with others if you're working with them, okay? So what do we do about that? The problem is that when you have these kinds of errors, figuring out what the problem is and how to correct it can be a problem. And it's even a bigger problem if the time between the moment at which the, the mismatch, you know, the inconsistency in the system occurred and the time when it's actually discovered is long, okay? So the more time that elapses between the time that you introduce an inconsistency and the time that you detect it means even more things can be done that were based upon that initial inconsistency and uh, you gotta unwind a lot more quickly. Does that make sense? So ideally, you know, um, ideally we'd like to be able to detect these, these inconsistencies as immediately as possible, as quickly as possible, as quickly as possible, because then we haven't done a lot of further work that depended upon those initial problems. And so we can rationalize the system, make it consistent, take care of the, the, you know, the compile problems, the reception problems, and so forth, close in time to when we actually made the mistake, and then you know, the system can continue on and we don't have many months down the road trying to put pieces together that just keep running back and forth. So continuous integration arose out of that notion that whoa, it would be really great if we could take care of those inconsistencies that will inevitably arise when people are working on their code as fast as possible. And there were some preconditions that had to be satisfied in order to do it. First thing is, you have to be able to build and test the system automatically, okay? Because you want it to be all done automatically. The system must be on the configuration that you put and crucially, people need to be committing to things with frequency. So the whole thing falls apart if you don't. If you work on some, you know, part of your system, but don't commit it to the to the repository, you know, except every month or so. So you've got to be able to actually divide up your work into component pieces, such that you can finish kind of a logical chunk. The system all works, and you can commit that chunk. Now, if, if all these things are satisfied, then what you can do is you can have a, another tool that sits out there that's monitoring the, the configuration management of the repository to see when anybody commits anything. And every time somebody commits something, this tool should automatically check out the new versions of the system, run your build script, run your tests, make sure everything is okay. And if everything's not okay, email the So what this does is this leads to this idea of continuous integration that the name suggests, which is that people are working currently, doing development, but doing development in very tiny increments, increments of only a day or two of work, at which point they check in their changes to the repository. And we have a tool which now automatically makes sure that the resulting you know, committed version of the system is going to pass all of the problems that you've identified. Okay, so it's really awesome. Um, the nice thing about it is that you know you know when the system is now up to speed. If 
in the state as long as people are paying them regularly and they are quickly. Um, furthermore, um, because people are paid even more frequently, because they get this benefit of continuous integration, that means it's just a bit more, de you know, it's deployable. It, it moves in along in smaller increments, so they're always, you know, kind of usable at that point in time, which leads to a, a nice extension of life. Now, what's great about where you guys are is that you now know how to build your system automatically. You now know how to test your system automatically. You now know how to put your systems under configuration management. You hopefully will commit payments to this system. So the only thing left is to have the automated tool that monitors Google's project placement and keeps it checked up and up and going. And that's what we're going to show you right now. Okay? So here's what the homepage for Jenkins looks like. Um, and, you know, it's, it's not a big deal. You can see that it's got all the requirements, blah, 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 blah. Okay? So um, Jenkins runs as a server. I've set one up, so you don't have to worry about that. There's the URL right there. And what you do is you log in to this server. Now, I'm going to have to give you the password in class. So you guys have to show up in class to get the course code and that's how this will work with you. Um, but there's the URL for it. And once you can log into Jenkins, then you can define your job. And it's in a simple job that will say in, in class, it's one that connects to Google Project Placement once per minute to see if you've made any changes since the last minute. If so, check out those changes, build the system, run the JUnit PMD to check on how it was, and then if any problems occur, email the resulting problems to our engineering department. Very simple, right? Okay? So what about, you know, this whole verify thing? Um, you know, do, do we still need to do it? And the answer is absolutely yes, except for you don't want Jenkins to fail. You want Jenkins to be detecting all your errors for you. That's because then you're sending out emails to everybody and it's not a mess as you're paying for all this stuff. Okay? Instead, you're going to continue to use Verify to make sure as much as you can that the system is clean. Okay? On your local workspace. And then you commit those changes and hopefully 99% of the time Jenkins builds it and Jenkins is, is basically going to run Verify itself and everything will be good. What Jenkins is great about this technique, okay, is the following situation, which is all too common. You're working on your system, you add a new class, you document it correctly, you have test cases, everything is great, okay? Verify one is like a dream on your local environment, but you forgot to SDN add that class file, okay? So that when you commit your changes, you're forgetting to commit that new class file that you just created. So on the repository side, it, the system won't even compile anymore, but you don't know it because locally you can run Verify too. So there's a whole class of errors like that um, having to do with you know, your, 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 the characteristics of your local system. And, and those errors are, are you know, kind of hard to detect because, after all, Verify passes in your local environment. So what's great about Jenkins is that Jen once you do that commit, within one minute, Jenkins is going to actually try to run this build. At that point, compiler will fail because you forgot to SDN add it. You can send out an email. You go, oh, my God, I forgot to SDN add it. I spaced out. I forgot to add it. You can fix it. Jenkins passes. Life is good. Okay, And hopefully that will all occur within this brief interval of time before any other developer is basically even – you know, aware or trying to do anything. Without Jenkins, what would happen is Verify builds good for you. You commit, you know, the changes but forgetting to add that new file. You think everything is great. You go to sleep. The next developer, you know, tries to SDN update at like 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning because, you know, that's just always how it is. And voila, the system's broken for them. Okay, and they're all bummed out. They do a SDN blame. They find out that you were the last person who committed. They think you didn't pass, you didn't run verify, blah, blah, blah. Then the next morning, you wake up, you see this nasty email from them. You write them a nasty email back saying, no, I did run verify. 
unless there's some problem with you, blah, blah, blah. Cold shooty met. We two, you know, blood is shed. We don't speak to each other again. You know, who knows? All this stuff could happen. And it could be all avoided by having Jenkins be able to tell you right away, dude, you forgot to add a file. You know, no longer compiling. Once you see that kind of error message, you're, you're going to immediately realize that's crazy. It's compiled for me. And then the next thing you're going to realize is, oh, you know, I should have done this. I had that in mind. So the tranquility of your development is going to be enhanced by having some ease in your work. Okay. The other thing that's great is also Jenkins um, and continuous integration in, in general serves as like a sanity check. Okay. So if, if it runs – Let's say that the system runs good in your environment but doesn't run good in somebody else's. You know, doesn't pass verify in your environment. You're like, you know, who's who's what's the problem here? Who's got the problem? Well, if the Jenkins build is successful, then you basically know it's some problem with that other person. And if the Jenkins build is unsuccessful, then you know there's some problem going on with your environment. So it's kind of this impartial judge of the buildability of your software and product. So that's that's pretty cool. Okay. So the way I want you guys to go about this is to define a new class, which you will have to add your name now um, and commit to your Google project called Jenkins.build.xy. And inside this uh, build file, you're going to do define whatever it is you want to have happen under continuous integration. The easiest way to get started is to say that what happens under continuous integration is exactly the same as what happens in our regular code. And here's the lines of code that do it very simply. You're going to define this Jenkins.build.xml. If you don't have the project name Jenkins, the default target will be Jenkins. You define the target called Jenkins. It depends upon the verify target. Okay, you're all done. And then you force the verify.build.xml to get out of there. Okay, I like you to start this way because it is the simplest way to kind of get a grip on what's going on. What you'll discover as you get more advanced with your continuous integration usage is that you may want to have your continuous integration um, build process be a little different from your verify build. So it may run extra things um, for you. So you may have um, basically daily um, targets that that get run under different kinds of classes. Anyway, there's more complexity that you can introduce to the continuous integration process. It's I, I like isolating all that build code inside a special purpose file, jenkins.build.xml. Um, but to get started quickly, we can just make it very simple. So that's the reason why I don't have you just run verify. I like you to set it up so that you can evolve and make your continuous integration stuff more complicated and more sophisticated over time when you've got the framework in place. Okay, so setting up continuous integration, um, you've got to log into a Jenkins server. I'll give you the path to some classes to do that. You define a continuous integration job for your project, and the easiest way to do it is to simply copy the Watt Depot simple app job, which I've got set up, and it'll do almost everything that you need it to do. I'll go through that in a second. And then you want to kind of build the system. You want to do a test commit to see that um, – you know, everything is um, works fine when, when you commit, when you make a change, run verify. And then also it's important and make sure that the build is triggered within a minute. And then it's also important to check to see what happens when you make a change that actually breaks something that we have programmed in. Okay. So let's try that out. Okay. So the first thing I want to do is just show you that I've added – jenkins.build.xml to my uh, Watt Depot simple app application. And as I was talking about before, it's simply going to import the verify.build.xml and it's going to uh, run the verify build. Okay. And, um, you know, in my subversion, you can see that this jenkins.build.xml has been committed. Simple app, and then if I go to the 
Lord. There she go. There she is. Jenkins got the name. Okay? So this is the first thing that's very important to do is to, you got to define this file. And it could actually be, if you can copy it, that you could download this file and copy it directly to your directory and then just copy it to this and copy it to this. But you got to have that in your file. Second thing you got to do is go to dasha.icf.edu slash 965 and that will bring you to the Jenkins continuous integration server for our client. You'll see that I am logged in right now as ICF Server 2 which is the username that I'm using and I will give you in the class the username and password so that you can log in too. Anybody can go to this site on the internet and see the status of the site which is but without being able to log in, you cannot even change the status of the site at all. Okay? So let's take a little tour through here. The, I'm, uh, the, the, uh, this has one job defined for it. So let's take a look at that job. This is the watch equals sync lab job that I defined a couple days ago. And what you'll see, it has a listing of all the different builds in the architecture. Um, it's got some things you can do. Um, you can uh, configure the project. You can delete it. You can build it if you want. And so let's let's just try to manually invoke a build. Now, normally, what happens is we don't manually invoke builds. We have the builds invoked for us automatically whenever there are changes made to our underlying configuration or anything like that. So maybe, maybe just for fun. Let's see if that works. Um, so let's make a change to Jenkins upload that I want to make. So currently, we will print So I've made this change. And now I'll commit and print this upload. So let's see. One, two. go back to this. And I'm going to enable auto refresh, which means that every 10 seconds, it's going to update um, the same thing. So maybe you can go back to that as well. So, we're so every minute, 10 seconds will populate. So I don't know the next time it's going to come here. It just looks like it's going to. I did have a few seconds here. Oh, yeah, that just refreshed it, see? So you can see down here every 10 seconds. So far, not so good. Let's see if we have any other changes. And we have a lot of waiting, but I think that maybe what we could actually do is drive to this if we wanted to. You could also, it's also quite interesting, you could have multiple concurrent builds. So let's say this build executed, so I'm going to do that. Okay, so now we it pulled the uh, Google code, you know, my watch equals sync lab um, repository. It discovered that I had committed a change, and it did the whole thing. Okay, so let's see what happened. So it just did a build, so that and we have a green ball, which means the build has been done. So we can click in to get a look at the details of this. So the first thing, if we click here. We can see that the uh, you know the the configuration um, of our disable auto refresh. Let's see. Um, here's my configuration management method. You know I could click these links and find out you know the details and find out you know maybe exactly what line of code I changed, which is pretty nice. But we'll go back to here and what we'll look at, which is very useful, is the console output. And when you're actually doing a change, it's going to pull to um, to watch this in real time. Okay, but it'll show you that you know this was started by a change to the uh, configuration management repository. To 
need to do updates and command. Now we see the changes that load that are taking us a second to make. And then it, um, it's going to run this command, which is just going to run the Jenkins.build.xml file, which is going to invoke the Jenkins target, which is going to invoke the verify target. And then we see all the stuff that it does as part of doing verify. The build was successful. Uh, Jenkins target here. So everything looks good. Okay? Um, and just to grin, if we go back to here and we do a build now, we can, we can manually fix it. And then if we click here, we can go to console output. Here it says started by user ID, which we need to know how this is actually loading. And then you can watch the progress of the build in real time. It's going to be successful. Okay. Okay. Now, let's just for fun, let's mess around with this. So let's go to simple application, and let's let's just delete a semicolon. Just doing this so you can see what happens here. So commit, 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 commit. Okay, committed. And now we go to back to Jenkins and go back to this project. System. Okay, and so we see the build failed. It's basically doing this now, and that means if we go back to the top level, you can see we got a red ball now, and also we could see that I'm going to receive an email um, about the fact So that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Okay. Right, but we don't like things doing that, right? So let's reintroduce a semicolon. Let's now um, go to the configure dialog so we can see how it is we can set up one of these things. Okay, we have to define a project name, and the project name should be unique within this Jenkins. You know, you can see now it's called Jenkins Build or something. You can have a description for an email, and then you can specify the Google Code website. Google Code website. You specify the. the I installed a plugin so that it does knows about Google Code, so I can click on that. And then you can specify how you want this thing to be built. And normally, in normal case,
conversations where you want to pull the thoughtful consideration in and talk to someone. And then there's this scheduling. And this is the time to um, pull it every one minute. And it's and it's actually if you you could actually get rid of that slash one if you wanted. But the nice but the reason why I specify it this way is that if you wanted it to be every five minutes, you just replace that by a five. If you want it to be every fifteen minutes, you replace it by fifteen. So it just simplifies um, your you don't have to remember how that you uh, crazy problem is working. So you have to you you refresh your memory so you can still find it. Okay, you want to invoke and, and what I did is um, I defined, I added a build step which said to invoke this particular build file, which would have to call part of the and command. Okay, so that's the way that we get it to invoke the Jenkins step that it also has to call part of the and command. And then the final thing, there's a lot of different things you can do. The simplest thing to do is to just email the developer when there's a failure. general when you work in teams you'll list all of the team members that you're working with and so that you can uh, keep track of that. Okay so you can see that it's been rebuilt now it passes and we know that it passed again. The last thing I want to cover is how is it that you would add your own process to this Jenkins server and it turns out it's pretty simple. Okay so what you do is you go back up to this top click the new cell button and let's say we're going to implement you know the raw repo auto one okay something like that so as a uh, I don't want to say as a convention in this class or as mandated in this class the name of your job should be the name of your project okay just like the, and the name of your project is the same as clip the name of your project is the same in AMP. The name of your project is the same in Jenkins. You need that one name everywhere. You use it as the name of the directory, the name of the file system. If you just keep doing that, you will find that as life gets more complicated, there's just lots of less things you worry about that you think about. If you stick to the main convention for all the different places, you can really cover it. Okay? And I know every semester some of you think, no, I don't want to type that whole darn thing out. Shorten it; it'll be way better. But I can tell you that it's not that hard. It's just not. Okay, it's always better to fully specify the name of your project and use the same process that you use for AMP, the same process that you use for Clip, the same process that you use for Jenkins, the same project name, and do the project name the same way. Okay. All right. Anyway, after this part of the little sermon, but I just see it all the time when I'm helping you guys. It's like, dude. You know, it's not good. Okay, so specify the job name, which means the name of your project, and then you're going to say copy existing stuff. So you're going to copy from raw repo simple apps, okay, which we just saw was the zip. Then click OK. Now we've got a new project, watch repo powder Jenkins, okay, and what you have to do. Basically, almost the only thing you have to do, well, there's two things you have to do. One is you have to change this to be the name of, you know, your actual Google code project, okay? And the other thing you need to do is change the recipient to, you know, who it is. Go.zip at google.com, okay? And everything else should basically be okay as long as you you know define your Jenkins that way that I specified the same way that I specified it okay and if we do save now we've got a new project called what repo powder Jenkins which is not going to work because there is actually no more repo project for that but um, if we go back up to Jenkins see now we're trying to build and it probably won't work too well because now we're going to history and we're going to try to change it to alpha and we're going to try to change it it's like almost immediately we get into this thing that it's just not going to work okay but had we actually had a project 
they would have all done fine. If it didn't work this time, you would have learned something useful about your project cycle. Okay, so this goes to here, and what we'll do is we'll take this and we'll delete this project because it didn't work out. All right, there you go. Your introduction to configuration schemes and continuous integration. It's very, extremely simple. I don't think you're going to have any problems at all with this. At least I hope not. And I think you'll find the benefits are enormous. Thank you.